Hi, welcome to Sense 101 Life Club. My name is Dr. Kenyanju Inganga. In Sense 101 Life Club, we train, coach, mentor, and inspire people to achieve their God-given destinies. Sense 101 Life Club, inspiring generations. Changing the picture. Changing the picture. A father walks in a restaurant with his four sons, aged between four and ten years of age. They are restless, running up and down in a busy restaurant. The customers are getting nervous, but one of the patrons couldn't stomach it any longer. And he decided to confront this gentleman. Couldn't you hold your children? Couldn't you contain them slightly longer? He looks at the confronting patron, pauses for a moment and says, well, I'm not sure how to behave. I'm just as confused as they are. <laughs> this morning, they lost their mother. Immediately, the picture changes. The perspective changes. Please understand, he could have chosen to change his attitude and read his newspaper. He could have chosen to change his attitude and prepare for his seminar notes. And then after leaving the restaurant, catch up with the first passenger in the bus or in the car or at home or where he works and explain how he met some four recent boys with their father. How fathers have been unable to contain their children. Where are we headed? He ignored the situation. He didn't react to it. He changed his attitude. Because he doesn't understand their delaying factors. But when he hears the real story, he changes his perspective. And he asked this man, how can I help with the children? Could you tell me more what happened to their mother, your wife? The picture changes altogether. My dear friend here, Dennis, was in Australia last week. And I want to ask you a question. He was going to a city, he told me, if I'm pronouncing it right, path, path. But suppose his host made a mistake and sent him the map of uh, Sydney. Path is in west coast of Australia and Sydney. It's on the east coast, southeast. Suppose they sent him by email the map of Sydney and he can't tell head or tail. And he tells the host, I am lost. And the host asks, what can you see nearby? He says, well, I can identify a hotel by the name XYZ. And suppose there's another hotel in Sydney, XYZ. And the guy says, ah, no, you're in the right direction. You're in the right direction. Just speed up the accelerator, step on that accelerator. You're on the right track. But the guy has the map of Sydney and he's in path. The man speeds up the car. What happens to him? He's as twice as lost. Because having the wrong map won't get to where you're going. Even if you speed up, you're getting more lost because you have the wrong picture. Let me just ask two people a question. Where do you come from? This is Miriam. Where do you come from? Vihiga. Please give me an estimate of 100 kilometers from this hotel. 100 kilometers. Give me an estimate. Limuru. Nevasha. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, that's one route. Let me ask another person. Dr. Beria. Dr. Helen Beria is the dean of students, uh, the, the, the dean of H SHRDJ Quart. Please, give me an estimate of 100 kilometers. Kirinyaga. Kirinyaga. Now, by the way, I'm not playing games. I didn't tell her I'm going to ask this question. I didn't tell her. <laughs> I didn't tell her. She's visualizing the direction towards Meru because she comes from Meru. <laughs> Did you get? Are you with me? It must be from here to Kirinyaga. She comes from Vihiga. It must be here to Naivasha. If I pick a guy from Kibwezi, it must be here to Salama. That is their perspective. That is how they see their world. Am I communicating? That's your world view. You know, the reason I wanted to start there is because you can change your clothes. You can change your name. You can change your residence. You can change your color pigmentation and undergo a plastic surgery. You can even change your spouse. When I was busy in 
that export business. I remember one day I talked with a guy from Belgium. He was one of our clients. And he told me he's with wife number three. I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> I've never heard such a thing before. I'm here, I'm taking coffee with wife number three. And he was saying it's so casual. You see, my perspective, that is mind boggling. You can change many things, but if you don't change your mind, you will not have changed your world because you didn't change your inside. The reality is if you don't change the roots, you will never change the fruit. You see, this term paradigm shift was popularized by a man by the name Thomas Kuhn in his landmark book, The Structure of Scientific Thinking. And he took great pains to prove that during all scientific revolutions, they were all preceded by a change of the mindset, a mind shift, a paradigm shift, a change of the mental picture. You see, although some of the statements I'm going to make tonight are going to sound harsh, I say it with good faith. Some of us are in relational crisis because the perspective we have about marriage is all wrong. And we hold it so close to our chest. And today I want to suggest maybe, just maybe, there is another reality that exists. Maybe your perception about how to run business could all be wrong. And let me prove to you. Many years ago, Isaac Newton gave the world what we call the law of gravity. And that's a reality. And if you don't believe it after this meeting, please just go to the rooftop and jump. Before you reach the ground floor, you will agree there is a law called the law of gravity. Now, that's a reality. That's a reality. But is that the only reality? How come planes fly? How come rockets defy gravity? Because there is a higher law, the law of aerodynamics. And I want to suggest you could be holding a certain reality for so long because no one has challenged that reality. And today, if you allow me, I want to discuss with you some seven shifts that you need to undergo to realize your God-given destiny. The first, I'm going to discuss with you a shift about your thinking. Shifting your thinking. Number two, I'm going to discuss with you about shifting your focus. Number three, shifting your self-talk. Number four, shifting. Are you with me? Your associations. Number five, shifting your environment. Number six, shifting from excuses. Number seven and the last one, shifting your limits. Number one, shifting your thinking. Shifting your thinking. Allow me tonight to just pull out some three laws that might change the way you reason, the way you look at life, the way you look at marriage, the way you look at business, the way you look at your country, the way you look at yourself, the way you look at your job. And the first law, I'm going to call it tonight, the law of the mind. The law of the mind states that you are your mind. You are your mind. You don't have a mind. You are your mind. You have a brain, you have a body, but you are your mind. Vincent, right? You're an engineer. What's your training? Entrepreneurship. Yeah? Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. And what's your name? Sorry. Nelson. Nelson. I have Vincent and Nelson. Nelson, what's your training? Uh, security. security. I want to suggest to you today, if I remove his mind right now, and I put it in his mind, this is no longer Vincent. If I remove his mind, this is no longer Vincent. You are your mind. That is why one person goes to study law and we say they have a legal mind. They think legally. That is why if you reach the age of 50, for instance, and you're an engineer, and you decide to study law, you'll never become a lawyer, I'm sorry. You only have a law degree. You'll have a law degree in the pocket, but you'll not develop a legal mind. I'm coming back to that. Because at the formative years, you had a different mindset. And a lawyer will always look at life as a lawyer, even if later on in life, they decided to go and study other things. That is why people with very specialized courses like medicine hardly adapt to other options in life. And someone who has done a very general course, like mathematics, they can easily do different things in life, unless it was a specialized course in math, like finance or accounts or actuarial science 
or applied research. But if they did maths in school, the three branches of maths, applied or pure statistics, in its pure form like that, they are likely to adapt much more than somebody who was trained to be a neurosurgeon. Because he or she is conditioned in a given style. He's an engineer, engineer Kamaro. He looks at life from an engineering perspective. That is his frame of reference. The reason I'm saying this, over the years, doctors have money to do transplants of the kidney, intestines, thymus. Amazingly enough, including the heart. Doctors have money to do heart transplant, but never once has any single doctor done a mild transplant. If they did that, we have a different person altogether. You are your mind. And I wanted to start that tonight because you then need to appreciate why you must guard your mind with your life. Why you must guide your mind than anything else. You must apply every energy, every stamina, everything you have to guide your mind. Number two, law number two. Before I say that, you know, in India, they have a unique way of training elephants. When the calf is about two to three weeks old, it's tied with a rope. And every time it tries to defy authority, it is sweeped so hard. Such that in just a span of about two years, it grows to a huge monster that can literally write off an entire village. But guess what? It is controlled by a 13-year-old boy, a 13-year-old girl. Physically, an elephant. Mentally, it is behaving like one of the sheep or the goats. It is totally destroyed. It was conditioned to be a slave. Slave to their duties. It has no clue that it's an elephant any longer. So kids play with it anyhow. They will ride on the elephant. Believe it or not, if it is raised in the jungle, you can't tell a difference between that elephant and the wild ones in terms of their physical. But when you come across a wild elephant, you might not be the one narrating the story. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Because you are your mind. Law number two. The law of use. The law of use. The law of use states that whatever you don't use, you lose. Whatever you don't use, you lose. For hundreds of years, it was never believed any human being could run a mile in less than four minutes. And every time a breed tried to do it, the water of the doctor would come alive. No one can run a mile in less than four minutes. And they never attempted because they were told and conditioned, if you try to run a mile in less than four minutes, your heart will explode, the human body can't bear it. But a day like today, on 6th of May, 1954, Roger Bannister, a medical student, an athlete, coupling with rigorous exercises, did run that mile in three minutes, 59 seconds, and four milliseconds. And because he bashed that barrier, that same year, nine other athletes broke the barrier. And he proved to the world it was not a physical impossibility, it was a mental limitation. Let me say this, whatever you don't use, you lose. If you're used to jogging for a kilometer, and then you stretch by 10 meters, it makes you that much stronger. You know, from where I come from, it is not the most renowned musicians who are the most gifted in this country. The most gifted musicians are not even known by anyone. But it's the guy who went and performed dysmorphia, but he never gave up. He went back, did it over and over again, because nothing comes right the first time. He did it over and over and over again with a lot of mistakes, but he stayed the course. He studied the business part of the music industry. No one began public speaking who did it well the first time. No one began practice of law that did it right the first time, but they stayed the course. They became students of life. No one managed in doing a, a, a nice marriage for the first one or two or three or four years. There were many issues to sort out with your wife. Many give up. They don't become students of life. And I suggest to you the gifts you don't use, the talents you don't use, the natural inclinations you don't use, you literally lose them. So I'm asking you today, are you cultivating what you already have? The good Lord said, even the little you have will be taken away from you. I make some hard statements here right now. No one will ever lay a red carpet for you to go and prove your speaking prowess. 
No one will ever give you a ready business to go and run it. Life doesn't give you what you want. Life gives you what you demand. You have to toil. You have to stay the course. You have to fight with your urges to sleep. With your urges, the feelings. We don't work by feelings. We work by purpose. We don't succeed by feelings. You have to rise up on a cold July morning and work on a hot January afternoon. Whatever you don't use, you lose. Law number three. The law of multiplication. The law of multiplication. You know, some farmers in Indonesia have a unique way of killing the monkeys that attack their crops. They have some jags that are, have a very thin neck. The jag is so thin, but the monkey's hand can get inside after squeezing a lot. So they put some peanuts down there. The monkey struggles and struggles and struggles and finally gets the hand in. But there's only one secret to the monkey's freedom, to release the peanuts. The heart becomes thin again and it's able to run away. But unfortunately, as long as the monkey is holding the peanuts, the monkey cannot release the peanuts. It has no hope of getting some other peanuts elsewhere. So the farmer comes and the monkey is struggling to get her heart out. The monkey is wrestling to freedom. But unfortunately, as long as it is clenching its fist, the heart can't get out. But it can't release the peanuts because the peanuts pay the rent because the peanuts pay the mortgage because the peanuts pay for a holiday the monkey can't release the peanuts so the farmer comes and cuts the hand the monkey loses sight of the cashew nuts and the coconut and the ground nuts and infinite possibilities holding on to the little peanuts the law of multiplication says this, everything God created has in it the seed to reproduce and multiply. Everything God created has in it the seed to reproduce and multiply. So God never creates finished products. He creates for us raw materials. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of human beings want the harvest. They don't want the seed. That is why people fight for stuff rather than for ideas. We fight for inheritance because we are dividers. We are not multipliers. Anyone who comes to Sense 101, one of the sense I'm putting in your head, never fight for inheritance. Go out there and multiply. Because people do not want to go through the entire entrepreneurial process, they dip their hands into government coffers and divide, it, divide the loot among their tribesmen because they can't stay the course to win the battle. And it doesn't matter their level, whether they are cabinet secretaries, whether it's an MP running a CDF account, whether it's a school principal, whether it's a doctor running a hospital facility, this is the mentality in this country and in Africa in general. We don't want to go through the entrepreneurial process and put up an empire. We don't want to fight for ideas. We want to divide. We don't want to multiply. Economies collapse when we have a dividing mindset. Economists thrive and prosper when you have a multiplication mindset. And I'm going to drill that in your mind before you leave this all tonight. So the first shift, we're going to shift our thinking. Shift number two. We're going to shift our focus. We're going to shift our focus. You see, I read a story or some monkeys that used to jump on a transformer in a given gated community, and they would cause rampant perpetual blackouts time and again. And then the guys in that community realized that they have to stop the behavior of these monkeys. So what they decided to do, I think there was an engineer in that community, he suggested they come up with a banana, and they put it on the transformer and then connect it with a live wire. When the first monkey jumped to pick the fruit, it was given an electric shock when dashing to the ground. Never told the neighbors what had happened. The second monkey went to the banana. It was given another shock, went to the ground, perhaps breaking the ribs. Never told the neighbor. One by one, they attempted to grab the banana. Then they realized, you can't touch the banana up there. It has a way of dealing with you. 
Do you know what? The neighbors were trying to change their focus to another place. Did you know as human beings, we never change when we see the light, we change when we feel the heat. And I want to suggest some three things for you to ponder about. Number one, life has no vacuum. Life has no vacuum. Are you with me? So if you are struggling with a certain addiction and you are hearing my voice, never cheat yourself that you can change the behavior. No, you can only replace the behavior. This is one reason we chose these meetings to be the first Friday of the month because this is the time most people have the money so that you don't waste it in the clubs. Because you can only replace it with a good behavior. Life has no vacuum as I speak right now. There are signals all over. Local signals, international signals. It is up to you where you want to tune in. Does that make sense? You can tune in to good news or to bad news. But there's no vacuum. Whatever fills your mind, fills your life. Your life is an overflow of your thoughts. Let me put it this way. A managed mind leads to peace, life, and happiness. An unmanaged life leads to chaos, fighting, and wrangling. You know, none of us has a monopoly to the universal mind. If you don't implement the idea God has put in you, someone else will pick that signal. 